So, uh, good morning to all of you, my co-chair and the presenters today and the participants. We are in the final multi-hazard early warning and disaster risk reduction. I suppose we had good two days. And in the final, uh, this is the session B, uh, which is on uh, disaster risk reduction. I think this disaster risk reduction theme is in the uh, key uh, capacities of uh, team in the disaster risk reduction field anyway, because uh, I suppose uh, the, the, the symposium main name itself reflects uh, how disaster risk reduction is important and we are uh, trying to see how we could uh, incorporate multi-hazard early war reduce disaster risk. So uh, here we have uh, presentations based on, uh, mainly based on uh, disaster risk reduction. So uh, the first is uh, we have actually uh, six presenters scheduled, but there will be only, only five presenters presenting today. Uh, but the first presenter is available. The first presenter is Mr. Tushara Kamalaratna, doctoral student at the Global Disaster Resilience. Uh, Tushara's uh, research is about uh, starting with the interesting title, Res Resettled or Displaced, a social inquiry on tsunami resettlement program in the Kuala Division Secretariat, Sri Lanka. Tushara, over to you. Hi, all. This is Tushara Kamal Ratna. I'm a postgraduate researcher attached to the Global Disaster Resilience Center, University of Huddersfield. My research paper is on uh, resettled or displaced, a social inquiry. Uh, to induce uh, displacement and the resettlement uh, programs in Sri Lanka. Okay, uh, let me uh, start my presentation with uh, one uh, quotation by a prominent scholar called the Brenchin uh, in this field. Um, what he emphasized uh, was uh, understanding the social impact of both displacement and relocation is kind of a, a complex task because uh, we know that we can see kind of a immediate uh, impacts as well as the long-term impact. Sometimes um, we cannot exactly see uh, what are the cascading long-time impacts of uh, displacement and the resettlement program. This is the content of the uh, presentation. Well, uh, let me uh, briefly explain the research background. So uh, I think uh, maybe you all remember that the bad experience uh, we have in uh, 2004, uh, that was uh, the Indian Ocean tsunami. And I don't think that I need to remember you what were the the really bad impacts uh, we experienced uh, with that uh, tsunami incident. Uh, of course, we lost uh, more than 30,000 people in the country and uh, uh, economic loss of livelihoods and other infrastructure is estimated to be approximately um, uh, uh, 208.2 billion US dollars. And uh, another factor we need to emphasize here, uh, that is the disaster induced displacement Actually, the disaster-induced displacement became a kind of a serious policy concern in the country after the particular tsunami incident. Let me uh, contain some literature works uh, at a glance uh, in this area. So the World Bank highlights the need of more socially inclined policies and operations in the resettlement programs. And then the Michael Cernia's concern actually the, the loss of livelihood activities uh, because it is the main pillar of the resettlement schemes. By supporting this, uh, the SCADA also highlights uh, the restoration of the living conditions and the standards are really um, uh, significant in the resettlement schemes. By another research, uh, Xiao and Sandit, uh, actually uh, what they focus was the induced displacement damage, both economic and uh, social infrastructure. Uh, and uh, uh, parallelly, another few research, uh, they highlighted the need of understanding on social and demographic uh, uh, impacts more than the uh, loss in physical infrastructure. This is the methodology of the research. Actually, the research uh, design is the qualitative descriptive. And there are two objectives. One is uh, to highlight the social concerns faced by resettled people, 
the second objective uh, to suggest a social management plan to address the particular social constraints the field research carried out in the dikwala division of secretariat in the mathura district um, uh, for the field data collection two uh, different uh, resettlement uh, programs were selected one was minikirulavatta uh, it's kind of a remote uh, uh, nature uh, resettlement program and uh, the second one is little suburban uh, called the mudiyansege vatta and uh, uh, two data collection techniques were used uh, one was focus group discussion uh, with the community and to gather the data from the key informers the interviews uh, were used this is the analytical framework of the research uh, the irr model presented by michael uh, m sernia actually he was a senior advisor to the world bank for social policy department and sernia understood that there is a grave risk of uh, impoverishment uh, in resettlement process so in order to understand this he presented the uh, framework called the impoverishment risk and reestablishment model this is of course for understanding the long term risk of becoming uh, uh, more poor in this model you can see uh, he understood uh, the seven impoverishment risk the landlessness marginalization loss of access to common resources joblessness uh, poor health social disintegration and the food insecurity therefore the the, the analysis of the research part mainly uh, focuses with the particular impoverishment risk presented by the irr model these are the findings of the research the research found that uh, the marginalization is a, a serious cultural issue there as the uh, the particular resettlement places are called uh, tsunami gum by the local people it's kind of um, uh, exclusionary identity they have been given and on the other hand uh, the term watta is uh, widely used as a social disgracing in uh, sri lankan context and the land and property uh, ownership also a issue as uh, many of them do not have the proper land ownership here the houses were given to the displaced people those who were in the transitional camps uh, located in uh, ratmale godauda and uh, the maliad uh, it can be observed that there were um, many stakeholders have been involved with the housing project uh, the buddhist temple and a few ngos as you see in here um, however the research observed that there are uh, the several mismatches uh, can be observed for example um, uh, when it comes to the flow of the house uh, some have the tile uh, flow and some uh, people they have cement flow so and there there are no very clear kind of a boundary how they selected that uh, the tile floor or cement floor it's uh, making kind of a indifferent and on the other hand when it comes to the uh, the land size uh, we can see the land uh, 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 sizes are very different from 10 perches 40 and the 70 uh, on the other hand the serious issue here so we observe one fa one family there uh, with seven members but the the the, the land size is uh, uh, 10 perches and there is uh, another uh, uh, two members in the family but uh, they had uh, 40 perches the major issue uh, they face is uh, of course uh, absence of land ownership the lands were given by uh, using deed of gift therefore they are not the absolute uh, owners of the lands and uh, many houses and the lands do not have a proper plan uh, except a few cases more than two thirds of the houses were sold for uh, uh, 400,000 rupees to uh, 600,000 uh, rupees uh, to the outsiders um, uh, as a mutual agreement because the, they do not have the legal right livelihood restoration is the main concern of uh, the IRR model restoration of livelihood uh, is uh, really weak in these two settlements as observed by the research um, one cause for this is the uh, distance from the coastal boundary, uh, which has made uh, many barriers to the, the fishing industry. Uh, females uh, cannot now involve with the early livelihood activities they had with the coastal belt. And uh, they currently engage in small businesses in the domestic level. However, they are really uh, trapped in credit programs, especially the microfinance provided with very high interest. This has resulted in a very weak livelihood network. This is the discussion part of the research. Actually, the research highlights a few significant uh, factors here. The one is the resettlement project has paid uh, inadequate attention uh, on both national and uh, uh, global safeguard policies. Now, for example, 
the national involuntary resettlement policies and other so-called global policies. Uh, the second point here is uh, actually we did discuss the livelihood restoration is a vital pillar in the resettlement project but uh, both these projects um, had have detrimental impact on livelihoods. The absence of ownership of land restricts uh, access of uh, children to government schools and impacts on social respect and identities. Actually, those are kind of uh, uh, secondary uh, uh, cascading issues. And the resettlement programs uh, lack prior social planning and remain unsatisfactory as social issues of the affected people have not been really addressed. Here I have presented my conclusion uh, using a small framework. So you can see here the disaster and the, the temporary relocation. Uh, it's actually the transitional camps. And this is the resettlement program actually that we did discuss. But there's a gap between these two. Uh, you can see here the no proper assessment that we saw that in uh, distributing houses and the lands. And then there are certain social issues in the resettlement programs and that make uh, impoverishment impoverishment and therefore they have a few options one is the selling their places and the second is living with poor quality even though it is not satisfactory and the third option living with others maybe relation no other people however again if you can see very clearly they are displaced they are again displaced so therefore i call here the resettlement induced displacement these are my references. Thank you very much. Indu, uh, uh, so I think uh, before we start the questions, uh, uh, I think uh, I, I couldn't, uh, uh, my apologies because you couldn't introduce yourself, Indu, because you are representing a very uh, active and uh, what we call active and uh, very important organization. So before you start the Q&A for Tushar, uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Well, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Nuan. I would say that uh, you also didn't uh, introduce uh, or the, the banners didn't come as an introduction, but never mind. Uh, so I'm uh, Indu Abhiradna, practitioner. Last... Uh, 15, 17 years uh, representing various organizations uh, in the globe. Uh, so I had the privilege to work for many international agencies uh, right throughout. Uh, but my main background was uh, before I jumped to the disaster risk management arena as an IT expert, IT professional, but subsequently I have moved uh, into this particular field uh, with my uh, IT background. So I worked uh, for World Health Organization as IT expert, and then subsequently I joined for Red Cross Movement uh, a little longer, uh, where I uh, put my lots of uh, synergies and edges into that, uh, uh, from community level to the international level, and then uh, UNDP for a while, and then now uh, I'm working for World Food Program, uh, which had the opportunity the, uh, to achieve the global uh, uh, Peace Nobel Prize as well, uh, which is proud for us, and, and uh, I'm working as program policy officer there. So I have uh, quite extensive experience in disaster risk management field, especially on community-based disaster risk reduction as well as uh, building resilience, and I had the privilege also to author the community resilience framework for Sri Lanka together with the disaster management center. So with that, uh, so to you, Nuan. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tushara. Uh, thank you, Indu. Uh, and Tushara, uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. Uh, Indu, have you uh, got some questions for Tushara? Uh, yes, uh, once again, coming back to the, the technical points, uh, I think as uh, Dr. Nuan mentioned, it is really interesting and thank you very much uh, for your efforts on the study and about this, the microfinance trap. So. In, in in this disaster risk reduction world or the disaster risk management we are we have been talking about this microfinancing or livelihood support and things like that but we do believe this particular uh, microfinance sometimes creates uh, negative impacts maladaptations as well so this is one of the the element for that uh, which uh, bringing uh, from your study uh, but uh, towards from that i would like to us from uh, Tushara, uh, what kind of uh, you know 
national policies, legislations, or the regulation provisions uh, to have a systematic uh, uh, resettlement in this uh, country or in, in general in Sri Lanka? And do you see uh, any bottlenecks of that particular policies and legislations? Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, sir, Chair. And actually, uh, I basically went through the, the invol involuntary resettlement policy and uh, kind of uh, other uh, global level sort of um, uh, resettlement policies. And actually, uh, it seems that the policy framework is, of course, fine. But now the issue, what I, uh, uh, you know, observed was when it comes to the practice. So we don't much uh, oblique with the particular, uh, the policies and the recommendation. That is the issue because uh, this is kind of a vast issue in the uh, country, not uh, only in Sri Lanka, but in many countries. But I see what Sri Lanka is because we have uh, three sort of, you know, uh, uh, kind of a domains like, one is research and academia, and on the other hand, uh, it should help to the, the policies. And then the, uh, the, the, the third corner is, of course, the practice and the implementation. But what I feel now, the research and academia, they promote more sort of, you know, the recommendations and findings. And uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in some cases, well incorporated with the policies in some cases, right? But the main issue, not that, uh, the implementation uh, is taking place with another body sometimes. So there is a little uh, mislink. That is the main issue, not the, the policy actually. Okay, thank you very much. I think yes, yeah, certainly there is a huge disconnect in between policies and the practice. We are, it does need lots of uh, uh, regulation efforts as well as uh, integrated efforts by the various ministries, uh, departments and agencies uh, right around uh, at, at different levels. Uh, so there is a, a small query from uh, Mr. Mohan Sirivardhana. Uh, uh, but the, the question is not fully clear. Uh, if uh, Mohan can spell out, he's asking that uh, to what extent do you think that end user requirements are captured uh, and accommodated? Yeah, so that is his question. C can you repeat the question, sir? Uh, he's, he has mentioned that uh, to what extent in your study do you think that end user requirements are captured, which means in this case, probably the resettled community probably and accommodated. And, and I think it is well clear that it has not been the case. But yes. what is your view, sir, Tushara? Uh, well, uh, right, yeah. So that is the issue, actually. So that is what I'm uh, highlighting here, because uh, they have not really captured the, the, the real need of the people. That is the, the, the basic issue. So even if you remember the, the, the framework that I presented uh, in the conclusion part, so the many people actually uh, displays again, it's because of uh, the 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 uh, the program has not well captured the the real issue and the actually the need of the people, so they could have done a, a kind of a proper pre-assessment to decide what sort of needs are there and how they should be accommodated accordingly. So that's what not have happened, and that's why uh, uh, I uh, you see uh, say that the uh, uh, the particular programs were little uh, you know uh, a failure it's a failure it's because of the uh, that issue yeah thank you very much uh, and uh, i have another point to make uh, and tushara it is uh, like it is for you also to you know have a better understand that uh, since 2016 and 17 uh, huge massive floods in the country we devastated southwestern uh, western area so the resettlement process has got new shape uh, so there are certain uh, different regulation but i would say that those are ad hoc regulations has been put up through various cabinet papers and things like that but it's uh, it's uh, good to you know study in this case so where you can have a contrast from uh, the tsunami uh, recovery and the, the current recovery because uh, we do have resettlement ministry as per se 
so what what uh, government laws uh, which is uh, uh, in the in the in the enactment to address these ground needs uh, people's needs especially uh, talking about uh, or the concerning about their requirements uh, especially on the livelihoods as well as social well being uh, so with that uh, i think uh, we don't have anybody else uh, having a, any any clarification query or else i will hand over to uh, cha once again thank you sir cha thank you indu and uh, thank you very much to shara as both of you very clearly pointed out there's a disconnection between this uh, research and the practice so that is what here we are having this conference as well to bring the practice and the research together and with that i think it's a very good uh, uh, um, uh, next presenter is really good inter- very good to introduce the next presenter mr ravi so who is uh, representing the pa- practice mr ravi is from the disaster management center uh, i think uh, we could capture him in the his uh, details in the pre meeting but i gather he is a, a de- deputy director at the disaster management center so uh, mr ravi is presenting about uh, preparedness on problem focused solutions of disaster risk reduction case study of tsunami affected community at uddu turai and alia valley of jaffna district uh, so thank you very much uh, uh, to share again and um, mr ravi you can start the presentation i take this time for thanks to organizing committee to give me the opportunity to presentation now i am going to present preparedness on problem focus solution of disaster reduction case study of tsunami affected community in sri lanka the content of the presentation have discussed the background study area objective methodology output of the result consult con- conclusions suggestion for future implication the background of the study area the major part of the habitants is concentrated in the narrow strip between the indian ocean area and tondamana lagoon most of the part is covered with the sea and lagoon and it is potential prone hydrologic hydro meteorological coastal hazards and tsunami the fishing is main income source for the survival of the livelihood and economic development of this area the area was affected in the tsunami 2004 in jaffna district is very devastated affect in the northern region the settlement and livelihood activities were in between lagoon and coast of the indian ocean it will lead to impact of the disaster by annually because the area facing difficulties and prone to multi hazard disaster situation by annually and seasonally the profile of the wadamarachi east it has uh, the selected area it consisted uh, 18 gramalabadal division out of 18 gramalabadal division in 2004 tsunami the impact 15 gramalabadal division have totally affected the study area of the research it has a very strip and also the two gramalabadal division have been selected such as alia valley and uduthurai the objective of a research study to identify major cause of the life and property lost to identify preparedness measures of problem focus solution to reduce mortality rate of the tsunami prone area to test tsunami ready indicators capacity building for community participation and contribution for the tsunami reduction of this local level the methodology which i selected 
and conducted the focus group discussion with the affected community and field practitioners at Udutre Aliyavalai to get some idea about it, the affected and the future activities. Apply participatory assessment to troll as dance, walk and community mapping. It useful to find that uh, path, suitable path and sort of path to evacuations uh, along the area. Create awareness and conducted exercise among the community, gathered information and identify gap. It also the familiarization and practices to getting idea about the caps and, and uh, the community issues. Use tsunami ready indicators to test the preparedness level. It is one of the standardized regional indicators for tsunami ready and preparedness. Identify major cause of tsunami impact in Uduture Aliya Valai. The area nearly to the cost was severely damaged. The experience of the tsunami 2000 caused huge life loss and property loss. Particularly, 770 people lost their lives and more than worth of rupees, 2000 million property and livelihood have been affected due to this uh, tsunami impact. The narrow strip between the Indian Ocean Sea and Thondamana Lagoon, the people have to be escaped along with the sea to evacuation and safety location. The people have to move their own walking to the evacuation center along with the coastal area. The distance is nearly 15 kilometers they want to travel. Major preparedness problem has addressed that lack of understanding in tsunami risk and preparedness of evacuation path. We can see the overview of the tsunami affected and uh, preparation of evacuation path in this photograph. The initial activities con uh, contributed by the community for preparation of the evacuation path, the temporary path they have constructed, the investment as uh, 78 lakhs themselves they invested to establish this evacuation path. The continuous support for the sustainability path by the disaster management center because the, the temporary path, the flash by the flash flood and also the lagoon. Indian Ocean Tsunami Ready Indicators adapted from the Haribi EWS Early Warning System Tsunami Indicators and US Tsunami Ready Indicators. There are 11 indicators for this evaluation. The most of the evaluation, most of the criteria have successfully implemented in the selected village. But anyhow, some extent we want to continue as for the familiarization and the maintenance of the evacuation part and evacuation center. The poster developed by the community for advocating of the understanding risk, preparedness, early warning, and emergency response at local level. The community survey wall. Yeah. The guidance for the family preparedness and response in disaster prone area. The every family have received this uh, tsunami preparedness case for their own preparations. The conclusion of this research, the result of the research 
ensure safety of the tsunami affected community of the Udutre and Aliyavalai. The community and stakeholders were understood about that tsunami disasters can encourage to increase preparedness level of the tsunami prone area. Stakeholder agencies and responders were trained and familiarized regarding to response of the future real scenario. The community themselves be ready and prepared to tsunami disaster. It has tested by the indicators. Identify that uh, community participation and involvement are very essential to essential to identify the problem focus solution in the tsunami prone area. Community initiation and contribution is the milestone actions of the Udutre and Aliyavalai and it so level of understanding of the risk they have, what is that awareness. The suggestion for the implementation in the future, use methodology and approaches were reliable to problem focus solution and result of output in action. The result of output to enhance implementation of priorities and target of Sendai framework for disaster reduction at local level. The assessment of the community tsunami ready indicators are very useful to make tsunami resilient community and continuous preparedness in the particular tsunami affected area. The disaster preparedness and disaster reduction awareness within the community is vital to minimize the disaster impact. Therefore, the mock drill and other practices should be implemented in the particular tsunami affected area in the future. Thank you very much for your listening, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, it is very interesting uh, presentation, uh, which is a uh, very important aspect uh, you brought in. Uh, about uh, the the adequate preparedness measures uh, to mitigate the impact. So life saving comes first. Uh, yes, that is the the number one. And uh, can you a little bit um, elaborate? Uh, there are two actually two points I would like to make. One thing is in your uh, conclusion, uh, uh, you have uh, mentioned that uh, your research. Uh, has enabled to ensure the, the safety and the preparedness of that particular uh, communities you are referring for. Can you a little bit elaborate uh, how actually the research is being resulted, which uh, if the research kind of, you know, assessment is being supported, yes. um, that kind of uh, improvement, which is a, a very phenomenal case, uh, I would say. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, Hindu. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, your question. Uh, that is uh, what what I say you that uh, the evaluation three step we have done. One is that the community what they have focus for their life, life serving. The first they understand their own life within the con consequence or even the consultative process they have identified. They are uh, even though they not uh, realize about the livelihood, the first preference for their, their life serving. Therefore, the first identification as a problem focused as a equation path. After that, they themselves, they invest the second things. The investment also within that uh, community, community uh, research and community uh, mobilization. After that, we evaluate the tsunami ready indicators. That is why I said ensure the tsunami ready indicators, there are 11 indicators which are already prepared by the that, uh, IOTIC. IOTIC, they have uh, 11 indicators. All 11 indicators, the particular uh, division, uh, the particular grammar, Aliyavali and Uduturai, we have tested. We have tested from full, full scale drill. Full scale drill, we have conducted the full scale drill with all the uh, agencies. Then we have developed, we have tested that uh, drill. Through the drill, all 11 aspects we have tested. Then after we decided this is the way, that is the one main focus their issues as a evacuation path to their life serving. That is the main issue. Okay, thank you very much. And following up uh, on the on the same thing, uh, and uh, and Dr. Nuan, I had the, the opportunity actually go and visit that particular place. 
uh, around 2017 when uh, Ravi was uh, presenting to the minister actually. But uh, now I see the, the evacuation path has been uh, developed into certain level with the support of the community, which is a very good sign and which is the, the participatory approach always, people-centric approach always, which we are talking. Uh, but any any um, subsequent impact, uh, environment impact, uh, and we saw that uh, the lagoon has been uh, yes. detached to two areas, uh, yes. so which might be another case for uh, a heavy rainfall and flooding event. And yes. then only, uh, of course, uh, at the same time, it can be a barrier for the equilibrium yes. of the, the nature or the environment. Yes. So have you yes. identified anything? Yes, in this matter, again, also I tell you that I, what I say that in the preparedness, the focus solution means the first priority for the shortest path to evacuate. That's the one thing. The second thing is the, we cross the lagoon. When we cross the lagoon, that is, you know, Iranamadu, Iranamadu river, Iranamadu tank, when fill up or spill, definitely this path is definitely the flash up. That is the main issues we identify, the Tonmanar lagoon, that, like that. So based on that, the, the whatever we make in the path, maybe flash up. Due to that factor, we are putting that nature solution as a, a mangrove. We put in the both sides as a mangrove. You can see that in now also you can go and see. We identify for the nature solution to uh, to barrier for that. Uh, barrier means save the, the road for the sustainability. Even though this Pravi Suravali also, I, I observed that one. Pravi Suravali also, there is the people now, they use their path for their own. Therefore, I believe it that nature solution also already identified for the, uh, what you call, uh, the mangrove tree now will, uh, uh, what you call, grow up. Then definitely, that is a very sustainable way to their evacuation. Okay, thank you very much, Ravi. Uh, to the participants, any colleagues, uh, any point, any comment, any query to our presenter? Okay, I'll hand over to Nuan. Thank you very much, Ravi. I, I think it's, uh, again, very interesting to know how these uh, higher level policies are impl being implemented in, in the ground level. What are the issues with that and all? So it's very interesting uh, how, how things are happening at the ground level. Uh, so that's why I think we need to see how the we need to bring practitioners into the symposiums like this in order to see uh, how things actually happen and how we should learn from the practice to uh, shape up the academia. So with that, I um, invite uh, our next presenter. Our next presenter is Mr. Asita Di Silva. He's a doctoral student at the Global Disaster Resilience Center, University of Huddersfield. Asita is going to present um, on a systematic literature review on indigenous knowledge in disaster risk reduction. So I think it's again uh, linking with the uh, Ravi's presentation, having some focus on the indigenous knowledge. Over to you, Asita. Greetings, the panel and my dear colleagues. The topic for this session is a systematic literature review of community-based knowledge in disaster risk reduction. My presentation will be segmented into three sections as in introduction, methodology, results, and discussion, which is also again segmented into three as in community-based knowledge, international policies, and in the current context of disaster risk reduction, the community-based approaches and practices are highly integrated. There are many participatory practices and approaches like participatory mapping and participatory disaster risk reduction, which have been successfully used for disaster mitigation. Objectives are to understand the different terminologies associated with community-based knowledge in the context of disaster risk reduction and to examine the extent and how such knowledge is reflected in current policies and practices related to ERR. So under the methodology, I have used a systematic literature review and a review of international policies. For the systematic literature review, there were three research questions, as in what are the definitions and terminologies associate with community-based knowledge? How is community-based knowledge addressed within international policies on DRR? And what is the contribution of community-based knowledge to current DRR practices? 
the keywords which I have used for the systematic literature review is community-based knowledge, disaster risk reduction. And the related terms are indigenous knowledge, local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and disaster management. As you can see, I have used the Scopus database as the source database. And there were 31 research papers which I have used for the literature review. And you can see the search string as mentioned in the slide. And my inclusion criteria were research papers, book chapters, and journal articles were included. And the term should be included in the title and should be in English. And it should be related to one or more domains of disaster management and indigenous knowledge. And they should be published after 2015. And I have ex excluded the reviews, meta analyses, and commentaries and all the non-English papers were excluded. For the review of international policies, the most relevant international policies for the ERR, which are Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, New Urban Agenda, Paris Agreement on Climate Change were used. So in the results and discussion section, uh, the knowledge, there are many aspects uh, highlighted by the review. And under the knowledge, there are expert knowledge, there are scientific knowledge, and there are community-based knowledge. So when it comes to community-based knowledge, there are key terms under the umbrella term, which are the traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and local knowledge. Done a comparison of community-based knowledge based on several criteria. So all three knowledge categories are developed by communities. And traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge are mostly passed down through generations, but local knowledge may not be uh, the same. And it is also embedded into their culture and spiritual identity, but not the local knowledge. Local knowledge can be like a general understanding about their local environmental conditions and the local uh, the behavior of the disasters in the local environment. And all three knowledge types are gathered through observations and experience. And it is adapted to local environment. All three knowledge categories can nicely explain and elaborate about the environmental processes and environmental conditions within their local environment. And it is tested over centuries, except for the local knowledge, both traditional and indigenous knowledge has a long historical background. And transmitted knowledge among peer groups, yes, uh, again, the local knowledge may be sometimes, but both traditional and indigenous knowledge are the same. And the spread across broader communities. The traditional knowledge is yes, but when it comes to local and indigenous knowledge, they may not. And especially the indigenous knowledge, it doesn't have any broader community uh, aspect. It is very specific to a particular indigenous community or people or group. A long historical background, yes, both traditional and indigenous knowledge will have a long historical background, except for the local knowledge. And applicable to particular environment, obviously all three knowledge categories can be applicable. And all three knowledge categories will provide a deep understanding about the local environment. And it's apart from the local knowledge, both traditional and indigenous knowledge categories are considered to be tacit knowledge. When it comes to international frameworks and policies, first we'll talk about the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. So under the Sendai framework, all three terminologies have been used, the traditional, local, and indigenous knowledge. The traditional knowledge have been used under the risk-informed disaster decision-making and risk identification perspectives. And for the risk assessment, planning policies and strategies, implementation of policies and strategies, and understand of local context, all three knowledge uh, types or, or terminologies have been highlighted by the Sendai framework. When it comes to 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, they have not used the term local knowledge. Instead, they have used traditional knowledge and indigenous people. So under the knowledge, they have used the traditional knowledge term for preservation of ecosystems and preservation of genetic diversities. And 
they have used the term indigenous people there they have highlighted about agricultural food production elimination of gender disparities ensure equality relief and monitoring and these may not directly linked with, with the rr mechanisms but they have used the term indigenous people so when it comes to paris agreement they have used the term the all three terms of local knowledge traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge for developed adaptation act actions for climate change so they have considered not uh, like 2030 agenda for sustainable development paris agreement have considered all three knowledge categories uh, for develop uh, adaptation actions and as you can see when it comes to new urban agenda it has also used the term traditional knowledge but instead of indigenous and local knowledge they have used the terms of indigenous people and local communities so the traditional knowledge again they have used under the preservation of cultural heritage so if you can see the boxes here so none of them are directly linked with the disaster risk reduction uh, but uh, they are talking about uh, the community sustainability and the social and economic backgrounds and the preservation of their culture and heritage and so many other things so you can see that uh, international policies they have given some level of provision and some policies have uh, highlighted and uh, emphasis given enough emphasis about the community based knowledge and some needs to improve more in future so when it comes to contribution of community based knowledge to the rr it gives a better understanding of the situation and it gives like a deep understanding about the local environment and the behavior of the hazard so people will know to micro scale how these hazards are behaving and how these environment is supporting and how these environment enhancing their uh, hazardous situations and it gives an understanding of the spatial temporal changes they will know how it has changed over the time and it in information about the micro level changes and understanding of the local adaptation strategies and the nature and it is a nature based monitoring mechanisms so people have their own set of mechanisms to cope up with these disasters without using any high end technologies so that is that knowledge can be transferred into disaster risk reduction practices and they have the practices for preparedness for natural and when it comes to challenges of using the community based knowledge one is that it is degrading uh, because the new generations are uh, integrated with the high end technologies and they are neglecting their generate the knowledge passed down through generations and there's no validation mechanisms for the community based knowledge and it is highly specific to a particular geographical context and it is not equally distributed because it's only in some parts and you can't find traditional local or community based uh, indigenous knowledge in every part of the uh, region or the world or a country so to conclude my presentation so the knowledge on drr should be a combination of both expert and community based knowledge there are provision given by international policies and frameworks what needs to be done is to develop mechanisms for these integration thank you so much well thank you very much uh, mrs silva and uh, pretty interesting actually so it is my interest subject as well about bringing indigenous traditional uh, knowledge into the practice and then of course into the science as well uh, the very interesting fact uh, i would say is how would you distinguish this local uh, traditional and then indigenous knowledge so what uh, i'm i'm pretty uh, keen curious about to know about how uh, would you distinguish all the, these three dimensions which is very, very difficult because those are very interlinked so that is one and uh, but before that i would like to put a note uh, about the indigenous or the traditional knowledge or maybe which can be translated into local knowledge as well uh, in the tsunami uh, the indian ocean tsunami in 2004 you may heard or may not that uh, the 100 uh, or 1000 people died in bandache but uh, the next to bandache there was a, a small island called zimululu uh, 
uh, which is having uh, indigenous people in that particular small island uh, in the in, in Indonesia, where only two deaths was reported because of uh, their bad behaviors, nothing else. But whole other village, the community, whole community uh, has been evacuated to higher grounds where when they hear uh, 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 or when they feel a, feel a, a sound or the, the tension of the quake, so the traditional knowledge tells all the villagers to go to higher ground. They are having a mountain and they climb up that mountain and none of that particular community uh, has been killed. So that is one of the best uh, cases which we can hear. And uh, so I want to share with you uh, about uh, the importance of uh, indigenous or the, the traditional knowledge, uh, which uh, uh, always uh, impactful in our uh, in our planning and, and uh, risk reduction efforts. So once again, uh, over to Ajit. Uh, so very interesting about traditional local indigenous. Any comments? Uh, yes, uh, I think I can answer your first question. And thank you so much, uh, Chair, for your wonderful thoughts on the, and the experience and the example that you have taken. So uh, as you mentioned earlier, I, it, is, it is really hard to distinguish in between these three knowledge categories. So under the umbrella term of community knowledge, uh, when it comes to local, traditional, and indigenous, there are overlapping criteria as always. So for, first of all, if we take uh, local knowledge, so that can be like a very new knowledge which is generated, which can give like a proper understanding about the local environmental context or their best practices, which they are adapting to disaster risk assessment or disaster resilience. So that can be very new or that can be passed down uh, like a very old knowledge. So that local knowledge or the practices when they understand, okay, this is a good mechanism to cope up with maybe for a disaster or maybe for a natural or man-made hazard. So then they might uh, pass down that knowledge throughout the generation. So which becomes kind of a traditional knowledge. So that traditional knowledge may be passing down through maybe 100 or 200 years. So sometimes there are practices which uh, which uh, which can be under uh, like uh, identified within particular indigenous groups. Like I have read several articles about earthquake resistance housings and uh, the example which you have mentioned. So they might have a mechanism of coping up with the tsunamis, and they might uh, some communities may have different different mechanisms which they are practicing, but limited only for that particular group. So that is uh, what I have selected as the indigenous knowledge communities, which belongs to a very unique uh, community or indigenous people. So that is, uh, that's how I, uh, that is why I have selected several criteria to compare these three knowledge categories. It's very hard to distinguish. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Very good elaboration and very, very uh, insightful. And uh, following up that, uh, so I would like to, uh, ask uh, from you that in, in your study, uh, did you focus any countries uh, about uh, different practices, indigenous or traditional practices? So what is what are the kind of you know very interesting cases now? For example, I would like to mention that uh, this indigenous knowledge is is uh, used in for sometimes agriculture, sometimes uh, preparedness measures, sometimes response measures, and things like that, and of course into development as well. So yes. any, any cases, and, and if you could uh, enrich your study through cases, would be really, really important factor. Uh, so rather generically talking about indigenous knowledge, which is very impactful and uh, uh, important uh, via this uh, particular learning also to others as well. Yeah. So uh, this study is actually, you know, it, it's based on my doctoral research. This is like a very initiative study, which I really wanted to understand the broader perspectives based on these community-based knowledge and how it can be applied for disaster risk reduction. So in the next steps, what I... ...used... Uh, for disaster risk reduction, and especially I'm focusing on the risk assessment perspectives in the, and community-based knowledge. So it's it's going to be studied, and I'm still working on my research. So I'll definitely give focus on to that particular cases. Thank you so much. 
Wonderful. And we have uh, one query uh, in the chat box from Tushar Pradhan about repository database uh, about uh, Sri Lanka so after the tsunami. Uh, uh, in the country, I would say it is very limited, but if you go to the prevention web, so there are certain publications, documents, practices, which uh, you could find uh, about different cases and different uh, uh, different topics uh, after the tsunami and very much after the tsunami, uh, to be very frank. And on top of that, uh, the Relief Web is another platform which you can use uh, to see, see different, uh, which is a very much uh, emergency-based uh, platform, uh, rather prevention web. So uh, in that both, uh, both uh, platforms, you will find uh, different uh, publications, uh, booklets, and uh, many other uh, the write-ups uh, which you can refer for after the tsunami, which is very, very uh, useful and inf informative. And uh, on top of that, actually, we are planning with the Disaster Management Center from next year onwards, uh, which it is important to have that, that kind of repository or the platform for Sri Lankan uh, Disaster Management Center as well. So we will be embarked with WP is, is actually planning to support the Disaster Management Center in that respect. And then um, I hope I answered uh, to Mr. Tushar. And then secondly, uh, Ms. Rekha Nilanti, uh, who would like to ask a question? Or to you, Rekha. Okay, so thank you for presenting uh, indigenous knowledge. Uh, even I am very much interested to these subjects. So I just uh, giving some suggestions to you. Um, I think as uh, chairperson mentioned that uh, hyperbase of uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, not only for disaster risk reduction, uh, I mean, including uh, uh, indigenous knowledge in disaster risk reduction is very, very important things. I don't know uh, how we can do it. It, it needs need some kind of government initiating because Japan already, they have DRH uh, hyperbase, database and panel for this. So anybody can go and see their knowledge. I mean, every country's indigenous knowledge, they invited and we all, I also participated for that international conference. You also can go to that database. I just proposing actually, if somebody is here, uh, I think Ravi is here from DMC and all. So uh, you all can, I mean, do this uh, kind of collection. Uh, maybe in your organization, you can initiate this one to collect the indigenous knowledge in DRR, there are several things in Sri Lanka uh, practicing still uh, in village level. So this is uh, just suggestions. And other thing is uh, national adaptation plan uh, for Sri Lanka climate change. So it is, uh, I don't know whether Sendai framework for action now, given every country's uh, uh, member countries to initiate these things as you uh, correctly mentioned, uh, pointed out the last presentation, uh, Sendai framework for action, uh, how it should go link with the indigenous knowledge. But I don't know whether it is uh, really it's enough for addressing this part in 2016 to 2025 adaptation uh, national adaptation plan. So kindly you can refer that one also. Whether we are we are all speaking and when it comes to the implementation, like Tushara said earlier, we all are very hopeless. So therefore, if uh, the people are here in the government body in this sector, please kindly encourage indigenous knowledge in disaster risk reduction. It's still, Sri Lanka also many poor villages and they are practicing these things still. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nilanti. Thank you, uh, Ms. Reka. I think uh, very valuable uh, points. And I put uh, uh, to the message box, if you can share that, Japan uh, platform link would be uh, very much important and uh, uh, we are really thankful uh, if you can uh, send us that particular uh, information to entire group uh, which would be really helpful and uh, once again over to the chair. Thank you Indu and thank 
you very much, Asita. It's a very interesting presentation and as well as a very active participation uh, from the audience, which is really appreciated. So as uh, Indu said, we can uh, uh, have those links shared and also we, we, we can share the knowledge. And with that, uh, I would like to move to our fourth presenter. So we talked about the indigenous knowledge. We talked about whether people are displaced or not. And we talk about the community practice. And then uh, we are moving slightly different to, uh, uh, to, to the previous topics, which is using about uh, flood resilient solutions for urban planning. So we are, we are we're trying to talk about the urban planning interventions through the next speaker. So I'll introduce uh, the next speaker. Ms. Piumi Manage. She's a research assistant at the Department of Town and Country Planning, University of Morotua. And as I said, she's going to talk about flood resilient solutions for urban areas. Over to you, Piumi. Good evening to all. Uh, through this presentation, I'm going to present the research project done under the topic Flood Resilient Solutions of Urban Area on behalf of the research team of Department of Town and Country Planning, University of Porto, Sri Lanka. Uh, this research is basically an investigation on effectiveness of building regulations in coping with urban flooding under precipitation uncertainty. Let me start with the uh, intro research background. So, Rapid urbanization is making people vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and its compound impact is now creating a need of diverse initiatives for urban design strategies. Among the climate change induced weather related disasters, flooding plays a major role. So different types of floods are occurred due to different reasons. Uh, among them, urban flooding is the major focus of this study. So the condition and inadequacy of the storm water drainage systems are leading to the occurrence of flash floods in most urban areas and cause the degradation of water quality as one of the negative impacts of urbanization. Therefore, there is a need for building a rationale for uh, building regulations in account of uh, climate change. Different urban design characteristics such as settlement layout, size of houses, uh, the design and landscaping of drainage and flood retention areas are fundamental to events like urban floods. So this study was done with two major research objectives. First one is to evaluate the effectiveness of building regulations that is flood coverage for reducing urban flooding under extreme precipitation scenarios. And the second one is to evaluate the effectiveness of building regulations combined with LIT options for reducing urban flooding under different precipitation scenarios. When it comes to the methodology, first of all, we have done a thorough literature review on precipitation uncertainty, urbanization, surface impervious, urban flooding, LID options, and stormwater management models. Then we have selected the case study area, and then we have collected data for the rele data relevant for the case study area. Afterwards, uh, for the case study area, we have done a watershed analysis and derived micro watersheds uh, for the uh, area of interest. Then. After selection of the area of interest, then we have divided the uh, area for subcatchments based on the uh, drainage network. And then after that, the model was calibrated with the existence in, existing scenario. After that, model calibration was carried out. And uh, for further analysis, we have uh, derived some uh, scenarios. So in order to measure the effectiveness of building regulations, flood coverage scenarios and LIT options were obtained uh, through the literature review. Then precipitation uh, analysis was done under two groups in order to incorporate the precipitation uncertainty into the research project. And uh, then model calibration was mainly done in three major pers perspectives. Uh, as different flood coverage, different LID options, uh, and different precipitation scenarios. Um, the Kestali area is an urban area located in the central province of Sri Lanka uh, within Navalapitiya town. So it was located in uh, located above 589 meters from the mean sea level. And uh, here you can see the area of interest that was selected for the, for the research. Uh, research project. So there are three major reasons behind the case study area selection. First one is it experienced turbine flash flooding frequently and it experienced the rate of rapid conversion of built up areas and also it experienced significant precipitation uncertainties. Through the data collection, so digital elevation model 
was uh, extracted from uh, Alaska satellite facility and daily precipitation data was extracted from this CHIRPS daily data available for the globe since 1981 and build up area was obtained by digitizing the Google Earth based on the field observations and soil type data was again extracted from the survey department of Sri Lanka and drainage network is again digitized in the Google Earth based on the uh, field observations and flood heights for the model validation was uh, obtained uh, from the field survey. For the validation of the model, the 13th of October 2019 flash flood event was considered. Uh, the total rainfall of 40.12 mm lasted approximately two hours, which is the reason recorded event that was considered in order to calibrate the model. So in order to validate the model, goodness of fit test was uh, considered in this uh, validation process. For the test empirical flood heights and uh, model flood heights were considered. According to the uh, test, when the average of a relative error between empirical value and model value is within the range of minus 10% and plus 10% and the average absolute relay to error is less than the percentage of 15%, model calibration can be considered as good. So the average of relative error of the model is minus 4.11% and uh, Absolute uh, relative error is 4.44%, which represents that the model calibration is good for for the simulations. For the simulations, we considered uh, two LID options as rain barrels and green ropes. And uh, for the alternative plot coverage scenarios, three scenarios were opted. So those were opted based on the regulations of Urban Development Authority of Sri Lanka. So. Three uh, plot coverage scenarios are 80% of average plot coverage, 66% of average plot coverage, and 50% of average plot coverage. Uh, when it comes to the precipitation scenario analysis under group one, most frequent precipitation scenarios uh, opted based on the central tendency values of the frequency distribution of rainy days. So among them, mean mode 95th percentile and 99th percentiles were selected as central, central tendency values. Uh, under group two, probabilistic way of precipitation design is adopted. Therefore, intensity frequency curve was produced for the daily precipitation of 24 hour duration. And because for the case study area, durational data is not available. So the curve produced by assuming that the uh, extreme uh, values of different recurrence intervals are following the Gumball distribution. So uh, the recurrence periods that were used was 10 year, 20 year, 50 year, 100 year, and 200 year for the simulation. Uh, for the model calibration, heterographs were prepared. So prepared by assuming that the precipitation duration of two hours and it is following the standard deviation rule of normal distribution. Uh, then in order to encounter the research objective, surface runoff simulation carried out in four categories uh, of combined options under different precipitation scenarios. So under category A, different plot coverages under different precipitation scenarios was con considered in order to achieve the objective one. And in order to achieve the objective two, under category B, LID options with existing plot coverage and 50% plot coverage was simulated. Under category C, drainage improvement with existing plot coverage and 50% plot coverage was simulated. And under category D, drainage improvement combined with LID options with existing and 50% plot coverage was simulated. So in the results under category A, it is very clear that the plot coverage is only matter in the precipitation scenarios under group one based on the relative flood volume change compared to the existing flood coverage. And under group two precipitation scenario, the relative flood increment is very low compared to the existing flood coverage. Under the group two uh, precipitation scenario, the performance of LID options is very high. Among the two selected LID options, green ropes are more effective than rain barrels under the group one precipitation scenario and vice versa under the group two precipitation scenarios. Though the relative uh, flood volumes are reduced in each scenario, the flood volume reduction is still higher in group two precipitations than the group one. So the highest effect on flood reduction is showed by the combined scenarios with drainage improvement.
When looking deeply into the results, the percentage increment of flood is higher in group 1 precipitation than group 2 precipitation. And when considering the flood control under B, C, and D categories, 100% of flood uh, can be controlled only under group 1 precipitation scenarios. When it comes to the recommendations, this study can be recommended for the decision makers for the process of formulation of building regulations. And meantime, this study emphasized the need of consideration of preservation uncertainties for probability of accidents of different uh, different uh, recurrence intervals of precipitation as well as most frequent precipitation scenarios. Therefore, the output values of the model simulated for different options could be used by urban planners and designers in order to make solution features in surface runoff management. Uh, so when come to the further studies, future research have to be conducted in order to identify the other building regulations on urban flood mitigation under precipitation uncertainty. And meantime, the effectiveness of LID options and energy improvement was simulated only considering its flood control ability and the economic viability still needs to be researched in order to check the sustainability of management options. Um, and that's all. And thank you for, the, for your kind patience. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Piumi, and which is a really interesting uh, research. Uh, I would say very scientific one, uh, which is important in the in the Sri Lankan context. Uh, one uh, very quick uh, question to you, since we do have very limited time. Uh, so, uh, do you see any any linkages uh, in the national physical plan for such kind of adoption, such kind of uh, scientific approach? into the, the, the future city planning or the national physical planning process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in that, in my research, so I um, considered a local level one. So it's, it's a very small area. So in national physical planning, uh, so it has, um, it, it has, it hasn't considered that into that such kind of a deep level. So, uh, what I think is, uh, so we need to consider that level in national physical planning because uh, when I'm referring to those uh, details in national physical planning, so it hasn't goes go for that level. So it it it, it only considered in uh, the local level uh, policies. And uh, my idea was so uh, it has to be. It has to be uh, considered in that uh, national level also about this uh, urban flooding. Uh, and uh, so in Sri Lankan context, we have found only uh, local level research also. So in national level, there is a need of uh, doing such uh, research uh, in order to uh, in order to uh, make uh, so resilient cities. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, which uh, shows us that uh, research into policies and policies into practice, uh, which is uh, uh, paramount in this particular case and where the, the, the governments has to put more uh, attention, emphasis on these uh, you know, researches where our, our case has to be built up. And uh, with that, uh, Otto Nuan once again. Okay, thank you, Indu. Here we are uh, moving to the uh, final presenter today. Um, it's um, the final presenter for today is uh, Prakashini, Miss Prakashini. She's a former lecturer at the University of Sri Jayawardenepura and currently an uh, MPhil student at University of Peradeni, Sri Lanka. She's going to talk about a review on incorporating disaster risk reduction mechanism. I'm sorry, it, she's going to talk about flood risk of Potuvil Patu in Batiklo district, Sri Lanka. Thank you, Prakashini, over to you. I'm Prakashini Mohan Singh Kumar. Today, I'm going to present about flood risk of Potuvil Patu in Batiklo district, Sri Lanka. This is the research concern of this presentation. When we consider about the facade, facade becomes disaster because of the vulnerability. Facade can be categorized into five classifications. So flood is undercoming as a hydrometeorological facade. Hydrometeorological facades are much more important to the world disasters because the world's highest contribution is going to hydrometeorological facade. 
you can see this figure, the contribution is much more from plus. In Sri Lanka situation, Sri Lanka is more vulnerable to disaster. Based on the Human Watch Organization, Sri Lanka's Global Climate Risk Index is now ranked six among the countries. Earlier, it was ranked 98 in 2015. So, this table illustrates the CRI in 2020. One way it gives us the weather events are increasing, and the other way it shows us the vulnerability of the people are also increasing. Now, I'm coming to the introduction part of this research. On this basis, flood is one of the common natural disaster experiences in Sri Lanka. Particular district is one of the flood prone areas in Sri Lanka. The flood disaster that occurs almost in every year in particular district, at the same time, it creates damage to the development of agriculture sector and disturbs the habitual life and makes people to live vulnerable. Therefore, this research focus to examine the flood risk on agriculture sector in Pati DST in particular district. These are some critical reviews which are very familiar to my study. On this basis, Many researchers have studied different angles regarding the damages and losses of flood-prone areas. Some researchers have evaluated the social and economic damages on floods in particular districts. Even though there were some researchers have conducted to evaluate the human responses on flood issues. But the systematic approach based on the flood hazard map and the flood risk on agriculture sector were not conducted in this particular area. Therefore, this research contributed a great importance to identify the flood risk to GIS in Poradiva Patch of DST in Vatiklov District. According to the literature survey and past studies, I formulated the research problem like this. Flood disaster and its impact on agriculture sector and community have been increased in Poradipat DSD in particular district. According to the past studies, this issue is increasing actually every year. Therefore, I made this problem. I want to check whether this problem is there, but my study is proved that. Now, I'm coming to the objective part. So, this is the main objective of this research to identify the flood risk through GIS in Poradivu Pacha DST. So there are four specific objectives for this study. First one is to create flood hazard map for Poradivu Pacha, then to examine the flood risk in study lands as well as home gardens of Poradivu Pacha DST. Finally, based on my research, I suggested some recommendations for flood disaster and its impact on agriculture sector and community. Based on the research objective, I formulated the research questions like this. On this basis, the first question is how to introduce the flood hazard map. Then, how to examine the flood risk in paddy lands as well as home gardens of for the Apache. Finally, what are the potential recommendations to reduce the flood impacts. This map illustrates the study area from particular district. For the risk analysis, I selected one DS division that is for the river DST based on the river basins, such as Navagiri River and Andela River basins. This research focus secondary data as well as primary data sources such as informal interview, general discussions with authority to decide the rank and weightages, then direct observations, RGIS maps, 
for identification of the risk areas. Finally, solve some reflections for creation of the design map. This research focused weighted overlay analysis through ArcGIS 10.3 software. And also, the study used 38 soil samples for the preparation of flood hazard map to identify the flood risk areas. This is the most interesting part that I want to explain to you. And this is for the preparation of flood hazard map, rainfall, distance from the river, land use type, soil type, and elevation were considered for the preparation of flood hazard maps. However, the study area is small. Rainfall has excluded, assuming that the rainfall uniformly distributed in the study area. After consulting the irrigation enemy of the region, assign weightages for each parameter and also assign ranks within each parameter based on the different conditions. Considering these weightages and ranks, flood hazard map has introduced using weighted overlay analysis. According to the irrigation engineer, some main points were considered when preparing flood hazard map, like uh, low porous and low permeable soils are assigned high ranks, as well as high ranks are assigned for shorter distance away from the river. Finally, low elevated areas are assigned higher ranks. Finally, this is when we consider the first parameter. The effect of the river is classified into six classes based on the distance away from the river. Ranks were allocated to each class based on their influences on creating a flood after consulting the experts in the Department of Provincial Irrigation and Disaster Management Center of Batiklo. According to the ranks assigned for the distance away from the river, six buffer zones have introduced for the Navagiri and Andela River basins of the study area of Coral River Batik. So the first one shows the map of Andela and Navagiri River basin. Now I'm coming to the second parameter, elevation. The range of elevation of the study area varies from 0 to 35 meters. According to the elevation, the study area has been classed into five intervals to verify the flood hazard based on the hatch. Each class has assigned ranks considering the involvement of elevation on flood hazard. Therefore, the impact of different elevation levels on flood hazard and based on these ranks, elevation map for the study area has been introduced. So you can see this slide. The second one is illustrate the map of the elevation. When we consider the third parameter, the study area has nine types of different land uses. Based on these land use types, the study area has been classed into nine and Assign ranks to verify the flood hazard based on their influence. Therefore, impact of different land use types on flood hazard and based on these ranks, land use map for the study area has been introduced. So, the third one illustrates the land use map of the study area of for the repetitive. Finally, when we consider the fourth parameter, Totally 38 soil samples have been collected from various places in the study area for the Upati DST at an approximate distance of 2 km to each soil sample point. GPS coordinates of each sample point has recorded. All samples were tested at the laboratory to understand the textual and permeability characteristics of each soil sample. After determining the textual and permeability characteristics of soil, it was noted that there are four types of different soil exits. On this basis, the study area has been classified into four classes based on different soil types 
to verify the influence of soil on flood hazard. So, the impact of different soil types on flood hazard and based on this rank, soil map for the study area has been introduced. So, on this basis, the fourth one is illustrate the soil map of the study area. So, finally, impact of different parameters on flood hazard and based on these weights, after consult the irrigation engineer of the region, flood hazard map for the study area has been introduced using the weighted overlay analysis. Based on the analysis, flood risk of the study area of all the reflective has been classified into five categories, namely very low hazardous, low hazardous, moderate hazardous, high and very high hazardous. According to this map, about 8% of the entire extent is very high hazardous area. At the same time, about 30% of the entire extent is high hazardous area. Accordingly, the high hazardous area covers the large extent of the study area. Based on the introduced hazard map, flood risk on study land has been verified. On this basis, these five maps illustrate the paddy land with very high flood risk area, high flood risk area, moderate, very low and low flood risk area of four river patty. The total extent of high flood risk area is about 23 square kilometer. Out of the high flood risk area, more than 90 percentage is covered with lands as well as the total extent of the very high flood risk area is 6 kilometers. Out of the very high flood risk area, more than 80 percentage is covered with paddy lands. Therefore, these paddy lands face high and very high flood risk in the study area for the infected DSD. According to the introduced hazard map, flood risk on home gardens also have been verified. So these five maps show the home gardens with very high flood risk area, high flood risk area, moderate, very low, and a low flood risk area of four of the infected. So the total extent of the high flood risk area is about 23 square kilometer. Out of the high flood risk area, more than 8% is covered with home gardens, as well as the total extent of the very high flood risk area is about 6 square kilometer. Out of the very high flood risk area, more than 1% is covered with home garden. Therefore, these home gardens face high and very high flood risk in the study area of for the Obatic DST in particular district. Finally, the created flood risk map was validated using disaster management center flood analysis data in the same area. This task was completed using Eastern Province 2014 December flood analysis data of DMC. According to the satellite based flood analysis, DMC was identified the maximum flood areas in 2014 December in Eastern Province. So, the first map illustrates the maximum flood areas in 2014 December in Port Liberty DST. Then the second and third map illustrate the very high flood risk areas with 2014 December major flood in Pora Devapati. After overlaying, it was found that about 75% of the DMC flood risk areas of 2014 are within very high and uh, high risk areas demarcated in the created flood risk map. Therefore, it can be concluded that the flood risk map introduced in the study can be accepted. Now I'm going to move to the next topic about limitation of the study. On this basis, this study focused only the agriculture sector vulnerability for flood. Then this research Considered only the selected part of Navagiri 
and uh, Andela River basins in uh, for the Uppati DST for the risk analysis. And the final one is, except the key informed interviews and information, there was no other source from where this research got the information about ranking of flood parameters to introduce the flood hazard map. Now I'm coming to the final part of my research. So these are the recommendations based on my study. This study focused the recommendation in two ways, such as structural and non-structural measures. First, when we consider the structural measures, this study suggests to control the unplanned colonization scheme, which are built near the rivers like Andela and Navagri River Basin, as well as this study suggests to control the lowland filling and sand mining near the river banks. For an example, Mando South area and Ranamad water reservoirs area. Then this research suggests to increase the height of the tank bunk with the recommendation of technical guidance. For an example, Tumagani tank, as well as this research suggests to prohibit the destroying the wetland, which used for firewood and land filling. Example, Palgamon area. Now I am coming to the non structural measures. On this basis, this research suggests some alternative agriculture job practices in the study area, like curd production, milk production, and cow dung production, as well as uh, farmers have to identify the good quality water tolerant seed to improve germination rates and yields for various crops. Therefore, this research suggests to conduct the awareness programs related with tolerant seeds. And also, this research identified and introduce the alternative crop practices. For an example, integrated farming and multiple crop practices in paddy land during non-cultivation seasons. Finally, this study introduced the high quality water tolerant paddy and highland crop seeds tank for flood situation. For an example, T. Aman and BR10. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Prakashini. I think it's, it's a really interesting area to, uh, you know, understand and uh, take these uh, different recommendations. I would say that if you could uh, compare with different other location also, which is important in that respect. So uh, that is uh, another suggestion from our side. So because you can have have contrast uh, over two locations about different element at risk uh, and what how it matters uh, on the on the risk uh, of different natures. So since we have uh, you know overtaken the time, so with that I think I'm thanking to all the presenters uh, who made this uh, very insightful and uh, eventful and of course very informative. Uh, and then I hope that uh, your researchers and research, fi uh, research findings will definitely cater to the development of country and the development of the field and development of the world in general. And uh, for that, uh, my whole uh, warm uh, regards to you all and thank you very much. And uh, with that, uh, I'll conclude my remarks and over to Chair to conclude the session. Thank you very much, Hindu. I think actually we had a very interesting uh, presentation. Like we started with resettled or displaced. So if I wrap up this, uh, we started with the idea of resettled or displaced. And then we moved on to this, uh, uh, how the international policy level are actually happening in the, gov in the ground level. What are the issues? So with the Ravi's presentation, and then we moved to this indigenous knowledge aspect, and then the urban planning and finally the flood resilience. So what I think is we, we actually have a quite, a quite a small framework here, starting with the Tushara's presentation on resettle. So if we could look into that, 
we can link that with the when we uh, resettling people uh, with the concept of build back better if we could consider the indigenous knowledge to reduce the disaster risk risk for the future risk so that links with the sister's presentation in the in the third presenter and with that if we again uh, think about uh, ravi's presentation on number 2 if the issues are if the policy if the policies are not exactly happening in the ground level that there are if if there are some issues or the challenges of doing that again it links with asita's presentation on indigenous knowledge how we could incorporate this indigenous knowledge with the uh, with the with the policies and how we can combine it. And I think I'm most interestingly, I'm picking from Asisa's presentation, we have mechanisms. Uh, we have provisions. What we need is mechanisms to get them implemented. That is what needed. And again, it links with the fourth presentation, urban planning, because urban planning, uh, and the fifth presentation, because the fifth present has identified the flood risk in the areas. In that sense, how we could get the urban planning interference to scenarios in predicting the flood risk, because that is the current flood risk. And with the fourth presentation, we can identify the expected flood scenarios in the built form. So with that, it links with the uh, that two aspects as well. So I think Again, it links with uh, how if we want to reduce them, if we, if we want to make these people uh, happy in the long run, we could use the indigenous knowledge, we, we should use the scientific knowledge, uh, that is uh, urban planning front, urban planning could play a key role. And again, uh, we, we could uh, think how the international policies and govern, governing, uh, governing uh, bodies, how those could be implemented, how we should cater them or customize them matching with our I think it is, it is actually a very good framework within even within this session how we could uh, incorporate things together and uh, it came really well so with that uh, I think um, uh, we uh, while thanking all of you all the presenters and my co-chair Indu Abheratna I would like to declare this session 5b as close thank you very much <laughs>